I wanted to, to hear from you what your definition of what a gastroenterologist actually is, because I think there's some confusion as to exactly what you do. I think it'd be a great place to start to fully understand exactly what you do in the role that you play. And you also work in pediatrics, so I guess you can speak to that as well. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, gastroenterology is a mouthful for sure. Mm -hmm. We tend to just say GI um, just because it's easier off the tongue. Um, as a pediatric GI, basically I take care of kids um, who have tummy issues anywhere from reflux to constipation, um, really anything that involves the GI system. Um, so that includes issues with their pancreas and with their liver as well. Um, and, you know, through GI, basically I did a pediatrics residency. So trained as a general pediatrician first, and then you do three more years of a gastroenterology fellowship. Gotcha. And did you always knew you wanted to get into GI? Um, I always knew that I was interested in pediatrics, um, but when I was in my pediatric residency, um, I trained here at Stanford Children's, and we see a lot of, you know, complexity in sick kids, and I just remember um, being on my GI rotation and seeing, you know, how taking care of the sick kids in the hospital then translated to seeing them in clinic the following week. Um, and just seeing them get better and in that, you know, outpatient setting was really, really fulfilling of like, oh gosh, you're so, so sick. And then all of a sudden seeing them in clinic and running around being a, a normal, healthy kid was really, really fulfilling. Um, and so I like the longitudinal aspect of it. So being able to follow them through all these, you know, ups and downs in their life, um, but then also, GI is really great in that we have procedures. So even as a pediatric GI, a lot of people are surprised to hear that we do endoscopies and colonoscopies. Um, and then, you know, we also use a lot of like imaging and, you know, after the biopsies um, on the colonoscopies, we use our pathologists to look at the tissue. So there's a lot of aspects to the fields that make it interesting. Yeah. And you're dealing with a lot of different organ systems and I, I'm assuming so many different types of disease and, uh, variances. And I'm sure you're seeing kids over their lifespan, right. For some diseases. And so, uh, I guess how, when is the earliest you start seeing patients in regards to like pediatrics. And then I guess, where's like, where's the cutoff, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we start from birth. In fact, some of my colleagues who are in neonatal medicine um, will see pregnant mamas too um, and do ultrasounds for you know maternal fetal medicine. I don't usually get involved that young, um, but after they come out, um, even in the neonatal ICU, um, babies can have GI issues all the way up, usually up to when they transition through college. Um, I still follow some patients up till about 21. Um, um, is the cutoff. And how do you know, like, how would you even know that a baby has a GI issue before they're even born? I guess just explain that. Cause to me, I'm like, what, how would you even know that? You know, like they're, yeah. they the only thing they're taking in is the mom's nutrients, right? At that point. And so how you know that, that like you're, it's going to lead to that, or I guess you can explain it better. Um, oh, there are a handful of problems that can happen in development that, um, babies can have. So, um, for example, the babies, even though they're not drinking any milk in the womb, um, they do swallow the amniotic fluid, which is that fluid sac around the baby. And so um, oftentimes clues like if there's too much fluid, um, there may actually be a blockage in the GI tract, um, where if the baby can't swallow and is accumulating too much of that amniotic fluid, um, or sometimes it's detected on ultrasound. So um, a lot of the prenatal diagnoses of things like um, something called gastroschisis, where the intestines actually don't sit in the stomach, in the in, inside the belly. They actually born with like some of their intestines on the outside um, can be diagnosed um, wow. by ultrasound. Yeah. That's got to be intense. Yeah. Yeah. And why pediatrics? I mean, for me, I know we had a pediatric class going through grad school and and it was fun, you know, getting creative and talking, you know, uh, rehabbing with the kids and stuff like that. But I, I knew it wasn't for me. And I guess what made you so passionate or at least interested in the field of pediatrics, um, even like after even like going through med school or even before that? 
Yeah, I had an aunt, um, and my aunt who is now retired, um, but she was a pediatrician and really inspired me. When you talk to some of these, you know, older generation docs, she was one of, I think, just a handful of women in her medical school class um, at Columbia. So she was really inspiring. I always grew up looking up to her as a pediatrician. I um, and then when I went into medical school, you sort of go through all the rotations, right? Pediatrics, OBGYN, surgery. And um, at that time, I loved the complexity of adult medicine. Um, I think one of the things that really got me was by the time we're adults, a lot of our habits, a lot of our behaviors are already ingrained. And not that it's impossible to change, but it's definitely more challenging. Whereas um, if you can get to a kid and change their behavior, change how they start out in life, um, then you give them a different shot at their health and wellness for their lifetime. Um, and so I think that was really exciting to me. Um, the other thing is kids are resilient. Um, I remember being a sub I, which is like, a, you know, just getting ready to be an intern um, in my fourth year of medical school. And I was in the ICU and there was one child who I was in charge of that was super, super sick, like needed, you know, kidney support, dialysis, all this stuff. And within a week, they were able to get back to being a normal, healthy kid. Whereas I'm sure, you know, a 70 year old might not even survive something like that. And so um, these, sometimes they get better despite all of our efforts, right? And they're just so amazing in terms of the resilience. And so, um, and then you get to have fun. Like when else could I talk about just poop all day? <laughs> <laughs> Poop jokes are a must in Pete's GI. <laughs> right. And you use it for like diagnostic tools, right? In regards to like figuring out diseases and so on and so forth. Maybe speak to more about that. Cause um I I guess I it's difficult to understand as to like some, you said there's, there's testing. So like ultrasounds you can use to help f figure out diagnoses as well as MRIs. But I guess on that side of things with colonoscopies and other procedures, uh, what does some of the diagnostic stuff look like? You know, my biggest diagnostic tool is just sitting down with the kid and the parent and doing the history. Um, you know, a lot of people say that the, usually the money is always in the story. And so I always start out by, you know, chatting with the parent and obviously the child if um, they're verbal. If they're not, there's a lot of stuff that you can get from the exam with the child. Um, you know, uh, that's that's what we do as pediatricians, right? We um, do the exam and, and even if um, they might not be able to speak. There's a lot of sort of nonverbal communication in terms of pain, discomfort, things like that, that can be observed. Um, and so I would say that that's one of the most important diagnostic tools is, is the history mm. and the story. Um, and then, yeah, we definitely do blood tests. We can do poop tests. Um, those are sort of the basic. And then, um, then we might move on to something like imaging, like you were talking about, either an x-ray um, to look at the bowel gas pattern, um, ultrasounds, MRIs. And then if they really need to, in children, if they need an endoscopy or colonoscopy, unfortunately, it does require anesthesia. So it's mm -hmm. under general anesthesia. So we think really long and hard in terms of the risks and the benefit of putting a child under anesthesia to do that diagnostic test. But sometimes it's truly necessary, and we definitely will do that. Um, and then um, oftentimes we'll need to just put it all together um, after we get all the testing done and really um, see what's going on. Yeah. And it could be scary for a kid, right? To get a test or an MRI or an image. So I'm, I'm sure it's kind of like more in the back of your head of trying to be like, okay, let's wait for that. And let's figure this out first. And let's ask the right questions to see if we can figure this out on our own. Oh yeah. Um, I'm lucky in that I'm at the children's hospital. And so it's all a fun and games, right? And so right. our um, we have this group called Child Life. So they actually come, for, especially for a super anxious or a young child, um, they will bring an iPad. We even have virtual reality goggles um, for certain procedures. And literally, they look forward to it sometimes. They like, <laughs> don't want it to end because they're having so much fun. So I, I do think, yes, absolutely, it can be scary and anxiety provoking, but we try to make it as tolerable as possible. And do you run into issues with 
when you're running and when you're talking, when you're talking with the kids, I mean, sometimes you can have these helicopter parents. I'm, I'm sure trying to, to be like, they're experiencing this and they're doing this. And meanwhile, the kids in the corner kind of just like all quiet and timid. And uh, I guess, uh, how do you combat that? Or at least have you at least experienced that in most cases? Yeah, that definitely happens. Um, especially, you know, if it's the first time meeting the kiddo, um, they might be a little bit shy. And oftentimes I'll say something like, um, you know, mom and dad are telling me the story, but I want you to tell me if they're telling me the right stuff, because this is about you. And then um, they get all excited that they, you know, get to correct their parents. Um, sometimes for a teenager, um, it's really important to get the parents out of the room um, to really get the teenager's perspective. And um, there's very specific rules about confidentiality. And we really just tell the teenagers, you know, anything that you you talk to me about, you know, we keep confidential unless X, Y, or Z criteria are met. I can't tell your parents. And so um, that's really, really helpful in helping the teenagers open up a little bit too. Well, that's good. Yeah. And uh, I know either, either way, you're going to probably end up getting the answer out over a period of time because you're going to get to know these families and get to know them and hopefully, you know, figure out what's been going on with them. Cause usually GI issues is going to last for so long that it's, it's, you're probably gonna be seeing them over a lifespan most of the time. Right. Yeah. Um, I would say there are patients that we do graduate from our clinic. Um, especially patients, for example, who, you know, one of the common things that we see is somebody who isn't gaining weight appropriately, you know, they might just be, um, too slow in terms of weight gain. And so if they, you know, get back on their growth curve and are doing fine, then we'll often graduate them. But that's yeah, um, that's one of the things I like about GI. We do follow them for quite a lot while. And you do have this approach that's a little bit different than normal pediatrics or GI doctors. And you know, you've, you've had you have this background again in pediatrics and also now pediatric GI. And you also focus on holistic care, holistic medicine. And I guess this is kind of something more new. At least you were explaining to me earlier to the GI realm. So I, I kind of want you to describe at least what is holistic medicine in, in your eyes and how do you approach it with GI and peds? Yeah, thanks for asking. This is definitely my passion um, and my niche. So um, holistic medicine, we also call it integrative medicine, um, is sort of the new vogue term um, for what previously was called complementary and alternative medicine, so CAM. Um, I don't like the words complementary and alternative as much, mainly because um, alternative really implies like here's your allopathic Western medicine doctor and here on the other side is the alternative medicine doctor and it's separate, right? There's no communication between them. There's no, um, you know, collaboration and there's one thing and then there's the other. Um, whereas complementary means that they're side by side. So maybe a child might be um, getting a massage along with their, you know, regular GI doctor, but they're like, there's no interaction, but it's side by side. It's not instead of like alternative. Um, I like integrative or holistic mainly because um, it means that it blends the two. The, the two different processes are working together and um, there's communication back and forth. So I might not be always providing the integrative care, um, but if I send a patient to um, a traditional Chinese medicine doctor who's gonna prescribe them herbs, I want them to communicate with me so that, um, or the patient to communicate what exactly they're taking so that I can double check whether those herbs actually interact with any of the medications that I might be prescribing. And vice versa, I would love for the, you know, um, integrative provider to know, oh gosh, you know, your treatment actually did well, so I can actually wean some of the medications that this child um, doesn't need anymore. And so um, having that communication, that integration is so key. Um, the other important aspect of integrative medicine is that ideally it's evidence-based, or if there's not a lot of evidence or science to back it up, at least it's evidence-informed. Meaning, okay, we don't have, you know, 10,000 patients who have done this, but we've done it in a thousand adult patients and let's try to extrapolate from that data. Um, whereas, you know, some of the more alternative modalities might not have as much research or evidence behind it. And especially in pediatrics, we want it to be safe, right? So whatever we're doing, you know, safety is number one. 
I believe it. Yeah. And you started getting into some of these treatments. You said like herbs and um, massage as well. I guess, what are some of these other treatments for integrative medicine that you use uh, maybe on a daily basis or at least commonly? Yeah. So um, I'm trained in um, integrative medicine through the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine um, uh, through the University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, Andrew Weil was the founder of this center. And um, the um, Arizona Center really emphasizes um, lifestyle. So there are aspects of medicine that um, are very, very basic, but actually have a ton of science and wisdom to it, right? So these aspects would be sleep, physical activity, eating a healthy diet, um, having healthy relationships, and um, having um, healthy habits. And so this um, lifestyle approach is actually, uh, is actually a very big um, cornerstone of all the um, treatments that I do, um, mainly because, you know, a lot of our problems actually do stem from bad lifestyle choices. Um, and so I actually do a deep dive in all of these aspects in my um, intake and my history taking, and then, you know, try to affect change, especially in diet and especially in sleep and physical activity. Um, other treatment modalities might include things like herbs, supplements, um, uh, I'm also medical acupuncture trained, and so um, I can treat um, things like abdominal pain and reflux with acupuncture. Um, nausea also responds really, really well to acupuncture. Um, and then other modalities um, would be things like mind body. So helping um, a super anxious kid who always gets belly pain, you know, on Monday mornings before school, really work on, okay, how can we tap into their relaxation response? There are a ton of different mind body modalities like um, meditation, hypnosis, biofeedback, um, yoga, all are sort of under this umbrella of mind body medicine. And so um, it's very powerful and very little side effects. Um, so that's what we love in pediatrics. Um, and then things like massage, things like um, even, um, you know, certain supplements. So vitamins and minerals um, can be really helpful. Yeah. Do you, you, we mentioned weight loss and, or weight gain, and are you seeing a lot of kids with weight issues uh, over the past couple of years, or maybe, uh, is this something that you've just always seen and are, how is it trying to, to prescri prescribe or at least advise changing their diet? Cause even now telling adults to eat healthier is challenging. I can only imagine telling a six-year-old who only likes to eat pizza and French fries, like, Hey, here's some broccoli. <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> To answer your first question, absolutely. I would say the pandemic, unfortunately, has um, affected people's eating habits one way or another. Um, we actually are seeing more restrictive eating in our teenagers, um, but then also um, obesity um, in the in the kids as well. And so, I would say diet is a tricky topic to um, approach. And so, I always start with the child or the family's motivation. Like, why are you here to see me? What's your like magic wand wish? What's the one thing that you really want to work on um, to get you feeling healthier? And so, you know, if it's, you know, I just want to feel less anxious or I just want my belly pain to go away. Um, oftentimes we don't address the weight at all. Um, oftentimes we'll frame it around their belly pain. And okay, so how do you think the pizza and hot dogs, um, how do you think that affects your belly pain? Do you think that's good for your belly or not good for your belly? And then we talk about it and using these techniques called motivational interviewing techniques. So using the child's own motivation can be really helpful. Well, it sounds like you're really invested in your tummy aches to go away. So, you know, what are some things that we can do? And sometimes I'll describe, you know, a handful of things and then have the child pick like, okay, out of all the things that Dr. EA talked about, which one do you think is the most doable for you? Let's start with that first, right? Um, and trying to pick like one, maybe two concrete goals is way better than like trying to do a whole diet change because sometimes that's just too overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, even for like clients or people who I don't see for PT, just making small changes and saying, finding the thing that works for you is probably going to be the best option. Really? Like there's, I always get questions about like the carnivore diet or like keto, or should I do intermittent fasting and should I do this or that? And it's like, 
whatever you're going to stick to and whatever you find success with is the one that I'm probably going to have you try to do, you know, and that usually leads to the best outcomes. And, you know, you can make little recommendations here and there as you're going along, but do you, are you recommending any of these, like, not, I don't want to say fad diets, but just like commonly coined terms that people are kind of throwing around here and there. Um, so for our patients, um, we are very careful about prescribing a specific diet. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if a patient has something called celiac disease, where you know gluten or you know wheat products will truly trigger an immune reaction and cause damage to the lining of the intestines, then absolutely they have to be very strict in terms of being gluten free. Um, otherwise, it really depends on the patient's condition, and then. Um, you know, we have patients who have um, allergy and it causes um, problems with their esophagus and things like that. So then they do have to be pretty restrictive in terms of that specific food. But um, in, in pediatrics, we typically don't prescribe like a ketogenic diet unless it's for seizures um, or, you know, some sort of low carb diet, um, mainly because, you know, it's not been that well studied in children and also, um, um, kids are growing, so they kind of need all the nutrients. Um, so my mantra is usually like eat the rainbow. Um, I try to get a lot of different fruits and vegetables of all different colors. You get so many antioxidants in all these different fruits and vegetables, really good fiber. Um, and, you know, work on, on getting at least half of your plate to be fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I think that's great. And we you know we're stumbling on a couple of these topics that are all including to this holistic care. And I guess when, where did your motivation begin for learning about holistic care? Was it just part of kind of like continuing education to become a better doctor? Or was this something that started beforehand? Yeah, so it's actually um, from my upbringing and my parents. So I'm um, what we call American born Chinese, so ABC. And so my parents, you know, grew up in Taiwan and immigrated here um, in their grad school years. And um, they really believe in the value of, you know, holistic healing from a traditional Chinese medicine sense. Um, so I grew up with a lot of that. Our nanny would brew these like concoctions that would smell terrible and we would drink them for certain ailments. And so I kind of grew up with that in terms of like a healing tradition. Um, and then when I was in undergrad, um, I actually didn't know that I would go into medicine. Um, I did an internship as I was studying abroad in Beijing and um, was really introduced uh, more formally to traditional Chinese medicine. And I found it fascinating. Um, I also loved talking to the patients. I didn't think I would, I would like clinical medicine at that time. And so that really sparked my interest in sort of this dual path of learning, you know, Western allopathic medicine, and then also realizing that there are other tools out there in your toolbox that we aren't taught. And, um, and sometimes our, you know, classic tools that we have, medications, um, surgery, they don't always fix the problem um, or maybe not the root cause of the problem. And so um, I've really found it great to have all these additional tools in my back pocket. Yeah. And like highlighting just the essential things of just like exercise, diet and other things. And then you can, it, it almost like makes the conversation easier to talk about all these other treatment options where it's like maybe something with herbs or something like maybe massage or acupuncture it makes the conversation easier to kind of stem into that area and realm of teaching what you do with holistic medicine. Yeah. For sure. And, and do you have a difficult time kind of talking about perhaps a different treatment option with holistic care with parents? Cause sometimes parents want to be like, listen, doc, I just want you to get this, get this issue over with right now. Give them a pill or something. I don't, I don't have time for this. Uh, whatever we're talking about here, do you have issues with that? Or is it more of just kind of something that's integrated in with your care? And I know Stanford does a great job. And, you know, a lot of people who go to Stanford usually are generally more motivated than, you know, perhaps other areas of the, of the world. Um, I guess, do you run into that issue? I do. And I think we still have to be careful, right? Because um, even, you know, herbs sometimes or a supplement um, can be construed as, oh, I'm just going to take this and I'm going to feel better. Um, we do have that like one pill mentality, right? I'm going to take a pill, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to take my Advil, my headache's going to go away. Um, 
And I think sometimes when the problem is a little bit more deeply ingrained and um, you may need to do things like habit change, lifestyle change, um, I definitely tell my patients that this is way harder than taking any pill. Um, however, sometimes the pill can be just the Band-Aid. And if we can get to the root of why there's so much anxiety around going to school on Monday mornings, um, not only will we help the belly pain, we will set him up for him or her up for, you know, much more resilience as the kiddo gets older and faces challenges that are going to be similar. And so then sometimes I get a little bit more buy-in of, okay, you know, it's, it's not just going to fix this one problem, but we're going to make this kid the best kid that they can be. Um, and then I, I definitely warn the parents and the kiddo that it might not happen overnight. And it can take hard work, a lot of hard work. Habit change is super hard. Um, and so, you know, trying to hold their hand through that. Um, and being trained in motivational interviewing has been very helpful because the whole premise of it is meeting the patients where they're at. So if they're not quite ready for change and you do this assessment of how ready they are for change, right? Um, are they pre-contemplative? Are they planning? Are they thinking about it? Are they ready for action? Um, if they're still just pre-contemplative, like you're just planting the seed and that's your job and then you move on. Yeah. And that's interesting that you did. Is it, you said there's a course that you take them with motivation? Yeah. Motivational interviewing is, um, was part of the training that I did for integrative uh, medicine. So it was part of the fellowship that I did. Um, but you can actually get motivational interviewing training through other um, courses too. Yeah, I think that could be helpful for any kind of clinician, right? It'd be helpful for to learn that because really as a provider, what all you're really trying to do is change habits. And in order to change habits, you kind of have to understand the human psyche and the motivation as to why we do things, right? Absolutely. And I also think it's super helpful for keeping the provider from feeling burned out, right? Because if you realize that they're pre-contemplative, you're not going to be like, okay, you need to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. They're not even thinking about it. They're not ready to, you know, commit to that prescription. So then it kind of decreases the frustration of when they come back and they haven't done your prescribed, um, you know, regimen, you're not going to feel as, as, you know, <laughs> disastrous. Oh, I didn't do a good job. They weren't ready. So, um, I really like it. And I, it's a great tool that I teach my trainees too. Do you feel like that was a large, like switch in your own mindset, as well as your change and like how successful patients did when you started like getting into the realm of like motivation and behavioral changes? Cause like you said, you described it as like, you need to start eating seven different types of vegetables every week. And in my realm, it's, you need to start doing this exercise, these three exercises, two to three times a day and do this repetitive times. And they're like, I haven't worked out since 82, man. Like, I don't know why you think I'm going to start doing this now. And so did you see a giant change in the success with like some of your patients, at least like adhering to a diet or like feeling better about anxiety about school on Monday? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I think um, so the process of motivational interviewing is you want to move them through that um, readiness for change, a scale from pre-contemplative to contemplative to planning to action. And um, so I will document in my chart to myself, like had a discussion about eating greens and patient is at the planning stage. So, okay. Then I know next time I'll say, what plan did you make? Like, are you ready to actually commit now? Um, whereas, you know, previously, previous to my training, I would just say, you know, eat those vegetables and come back and see right. me. And so, um, it definitely relieves a little bit of the burden, but then also, um, the training also teaches you how to, um, move them along that scale. So if you find that they're really pre-contemplative or just contemplative, um, you want to say, well, what are the barriers? And then you explore that in the time instead of being like, what vegetables are you going to eat? What are the barriers to getting those vegetables or why not? And um, you can also talk about how um, confident are you in like even getting to the grocery store, right? Um, okay, if your confidence is two, why aren't you so confident in exploring? What can bring you to a five? And then um, just moving the skill just a little bit, um, people surprise me. And then the next time they're like, ready for action. Mm. 
That's great. Yeah. I like that a lot. And how has your interview style changed or at least are, are you, are you being more precise in the type of questions that you're asking or are you trying to keep it more like open ended and just see where the conversation goes? One of the biggest changes for me after integrative medicine training was um, being comfortable with silence. And, you know, sometimes patients will not have an answer to a question that might be ch tough or challenging. And um, as providers, we are terrible with silence. In general, I think we give patients 11 seconds before we chime in and ask the next question. Right. Um, but sometimes the beauty really is in that turning of the wheels, right? And so um, being a little bit more comfortable with the silence and then knowing when to accept that pause and let it hang and let it be a little bit uncomfortable um, has given some really great insight into what's going on with my patients. Um, the other thing I think is heart space, just having the the, the space in my own sort of being to be present with the patient and um, allowing them to tell the story. I think as clinicians, we are always on the clock. We are like always worried about running late. Oh gosh, this next patient's there. They're already checked in. I'm running, you know, 20 minutes behind. The beauty about um, my consults in integrative medicine is I have the luxury of time. So I have the time to sit there and actually really do the deep dive, get to know the patient. And then um, sometimes the the answer um, to their problem may just be in the history, like I said earlier. And so just for me, being willing to hear and open to hear their story um, um, really helps me. Yeah. And is there a problem currently in GI where they're not seeing patients long enough? Like, is that kind of like a commonality with other like family practice doctors where they see them for 15 minutes and say, get your questions out. Got, here's your answer. Here's your medication. Talk to you later. Do you see that in GI or even pediatric GI? I think it's GI? a problem in medicine overall. Yeah. You know, um, there's a big push to make money. It's a business. And so um, I think, you know, for me as a subspecialist, it's a little easier. We do have some more time with our patients, especially our new patients. But um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's always a push to do more, see more. Um, so it can be a problem. Although we have new codes now that we can reimburse for the time that we spend with the patients. So that's good. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, you know, working in pediatrics, you got to have a big, and you had said heart. So I'm going to use this analogy. You got to have a big heart, right? You got to have the ability to empathize and um, ask the right questions and become very involved with your patients. And I guess, do you ever reach a point where sometimes it, I don't want to say the word numb because that might be a wet, bad word, but where it just becomes more difficult to empathize with some of your patients. And I guess, how have you tried to uh, keep that, you know, that same, like, feeling of, I'm so, like trying, trying to uh, connect with the patient, so to speak. Yeah. I think especially in, um, the field that I'm in, there are times where you have to deliver bad news or you have to have a really challenging conversation, difficult conversation with the patient. And sometimes, you know, you're closing that door and then you're walking into the next one. And, um, when you don't necessarily get a chance to process, take a breath, um, that's where the, I guess I would say compassion fatigue can really hit, um, or you're just getting slammed over and over and over again. And it's, you know, bad thing happen after bad thing happen. And so um, one of the things that I teach my trainees and work a lot on myself is, um, is clearing and clearing my headspace, and then also just taking a breath um, in between patients, so that every patient is a new patient. And you know, whatever happened in the last exam room, whether it's because I wash my hands and I take a moment during that hand washing um, ritual to kind of take a few breaths and to clear that space, um, I also, especially after a, a, an especially difficult encounter, I will even. Um, do sort of a, a imagery exercise where I'm imagining like fresh light coming into me and you know just it sounds a little woo woo yeah. myself so I'm like okay then we're gonna bring the light into the next patient but it really helps um, because otherwise if you can't clear some of that 
you know, tough stuff that you carry, then I bring it home and then my kids feel it. Or my mm. husband feels it. That and that's happen. no good either. So yeah. it's really, really important, at least for me. Yeah. And you said you, you're also a, um, you're, you're working with students. And so you also are a clinical assistant professor. And so I guess, uh, what has it been like being, playing that role and teaching people, uh, to become, or at least are they, are they in their fellow and they're learning to become a pediatric doctor? And, mm -hmm. They're and in all fields of, um, all levels of training. So we have medical okay. students rotate through, um, residents who are basically pediatricians in training. And then I have GI fellows, um, who are, you know, pediatric GI doctors in training. And then, um, I also teach integrative medicine. So I have integrative medicine fellows in training. So, um, a lot of different trainees and all different uh, sort of levels of their career. Um, it's super fun. I mean, I think, you know, it's such an exciting time in their life where they are learning all these new things. And it, it's, it's really exciting to see some of my trainees graduate and then, you know, do amazing things with their careers. Um, so it's, it's really, really rewarding. For in regards to the uh, integrative medicine, mm -hmm. I guess you were talked about research and backing it up. And mm -hmm. so on the side of research, when ki I'm assuming when you have kids coming in and you're teaching them who are trying to become get into pediatrics, they may challenge you on some of these uh, holistic approaches. And I guess uh, what is the research in a lot of the holistic approaches that you're diving into? And you know, it's easy to say like exercise and diet doesn't need to really have a lot of backup in regards to research, but for the other things. Um, how are you integrating some of the research and what is the, the stance on research for uh, holistic care? Yeah, there's definitely not enough research. <laughs> so of course we would love to have more, especially in peds, in GI and in integrative medicine. Um, however, there actually is quite a good amount of research for a lot of the things that I do. Um, because I'm, you know, a pediatrician at heart and I'm at an institution that is, you know, um, very heavy on research, I'm very careful in terms of the things that I recommend, um, at least being proven to be safe um, uh, with, you know, some research studies. And then um, ideally having at least some research backing, whether it's in an um, adult study or, you know, ideally a pediatric study. And so, for example, something like ADHD, um, where a child might have attention issues, um, there's actually good research on um, things like um, supplements with omega-3 fatty acids, for example, um, fish oil, uh, to help with um, some of the attention stuff. Um, from a GI standpoint, um, things like probiotics for um, specific conditions, uh, namely um, infectious diarrhea, so like a um, stomach virus, um, or antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So when you get diarrhea after taking antibiotics, probiotics can be really helpful. So um, ideally there's, you know, the research to back up um, even the integrative modalities that I use. Yeah. And you mentioned probiotics and we talked, we were talking on the realm of research and it made me think of uh, the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And it's, this has been something that's been very popular over the past, uh, I'd say several months at least. And I guess for people who may not know, can you describe what the gut microbiome is and its importance, right? Because it's there's been a lot of research in regards to linking uh, the autonomic nervous system with the overall health of the entire body as well as the brain. And so I guess let's just start at the beginning and say, like, what is the gut microbiome? Yeah, great question. So the gut microbiome is the healthy bacteria that live in your GI tract. Um, the large, large majority of that is in your large intestine or your colon. And actually a third of our poop is made of um, bacterial cells, um, like the weight of it. And so there are hundreds of trillions of colonies of bacteria in our gut. Um, and that's the gut microbiome. Um, and the gut microbiome really informs how um, our bodies learn in terms of the interaction of the gut microbiome and the immune system. So in infancy, as the baby's gut microbiome is developed, um, the immune system and the gut microbiome actually does this beautiful delicate dance where it informs and educates our immune system in terms of what's 
self, what's non-self, what's an allergen and what's, um, you know, harmless and, um, and what's a bad bacteria. And, um, this education is really, really important in terms of how the immune system develops. And so um, there's more and more research out now that things like autoimmune disease, things like um, allergy um, have a huge connection with the gut microbiome. And then, yeah. No, no, you're good. Um, And then your second question in terms of the autonomic nervous system and the brain gut connection, that's definitely a hot topic of research. I think probably in the next three to five years, we'll have even more. Right now, a lot of that um, is based a lot on the animal studies with mice and things like that. But, um, you know, we are finding that there's more and more of a connection between our brain, our emotions, our autonomic nervous system, which is like the fight or flight, which balances with the um, rest and digest modes, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system, um, and our gut. And we even know now that the bacteria in our GI system um, produce neurotransmitters. Not all of them cross over the, you know, the blood brain barrier to affect our brain, but it does potentially modulate or change the amount of um, neurotransmitters that our brain makes. And so I think as this research will evolve, we will definitely learn more in terms of how the food that we eat will affect the gut microbiome and how the gut microbiome affects our health. Yeah. And for those that may not know the autonomic nervous system. So there's three parts of the nervous system. There's a central nervous system. There's the, which is like your brain and your spinal cord. There's the peripheral nervous system, which are the little extensions that come off from the central nervous system. And then there's the autonomic nervous system, which essentially is like the small little brain child thing. That's like in your gut essentially. And why it's important is because the autonomic nervous system does things on its own without communicate communication to the brain. So it has its own processes that it completes without the brain saying, Hey, do this, do that. And so it's important because it's interesting. The fact that there's this whole system in our gut that does things on its own without the brain saying, Hey, do this, which is really, really strange. Right. Yeah. I think, um, some of the nuances are that we have the enteric nervous system, which is in the gut. Mm -hmm. And then the autonomic nervous system, which is like the vagus nerve, which is in uh, in charge of the rest and digest or the parasympathetic branch um, communicates with that. And yeah, you're absolutely right in that, you know, it's not a voluntary thing, at least to the extent that we think it is. Um, There are ways to tap into it using some mind-body approaches um, like hypnosis, like meditation, where, you know, even things like our heart rate and our blood pressure, we think that we don't have that much voluntary control over it. But um, if you're able to tap into that autonomic nervous system, you can actually affect some of those um, responses that typically we don't think we can control. Yeah. And talking about the gut microbiome, there's this also talk about like good and bad bacteria. And I guess is, are there good and bad bacteria and, uh, how do we get more good stuff? I guess. Yeah. Great question. Um, I think obviously it's such a complex system. Um, it's hard to, you know, say good and bad, although we, we often do. Um, I would say that, you know, after things like a course of antibiotics or after traveling and you get a bad infection, there's definitely what we call dysbiosis, which means um, an imbalance of the healthy and the unhealthy bacteria in the gut. And so when you have more of the unhealthy, then it can cause problems like GI upset, diarrhea, bloating. Um, And then, you know, then the challenge is how do we get back to that normal? Um, or a healthy, balanced gut microbiome. And so um, one of my favorites is actually just eating healthier food. Um, So, you know, if you feed the healthy bacteria what they want, then they will proliferate and grow and get more, right? So I, for the kids, you know, I always have these like fun kid analogies, but I think it'll help, you know, our regular audience as well is that it's kind of like the zoo. So if you feed, you know, all the giraffes, all the grass, and like all the plant eaters, all the grass and the good stuff, then those bacteria will grow. Um, But if we sort of eat things like candy all day, then you're actually gonna be feeding the bacteria that love to gobble up candy. And then that type of bacteria will grow. And, And our 
human bodies are actually not programmed to um, digest a ton of processed sugar because that's not what our ancestors ate, right? It was hard to find sugar cane and things like that. So um, our, our bodies are much happier when we get a, a lot of fiber. And so um, we want to give the gut microbiome a lot of fiber, a lot of healthy fruits and vegetables so that we can grow the healthy bacteria. And this is more of like a chronic eating of like bad stuff versus like in a, like in a direct acute or am I wrong in saying that? Cause I can, like, I love cake. I love cheesecake. I love cookies. And like, I don't want to eat every time I eat a piece of cheesecake thinking oh, I'm making those bad, <laughs> making those bad bacteria replicate. And so I guess the only time you really run into issues is when you're like chronically or like repetitively just eating these, these like sh highly sugary yeah, processed foods or whatever. I think for sure it's definitely relative and obviously I'm all for the good gooey chocolate chip cookie. Like oh, yeah. who can say no to that. Um, but I would say that, you know, for my kids, we talk about sometimes foods and everyday foods, right? And so ideally you have your treat foods and then you also have those everyday foods that you eat that keep your body going healthy and strong. And so, um, um, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, I mean, obviously if you were having, you know, cookies, candy and cake, three meals a day and snacks, then you're not going to have great, healthy, diverse um, bacteria in your gut. And that can definitely lead to problems. And how important is it uh, when you were younger? Cause very earlier you were talking about, um, you know, changing the habits of kids and changing uh, their diet and you can do it early and it'll change them forever. And I guess how important is it for kids to be exposed to many different food types or groups of foods so that way they can have a diverse palate, so to speak? I think the more the better earlier on, um, but I do think that kids are programmed to be a little bit more suspicious of new foods early on too. If you think evolutionarily, like you don't want the two-year-old wandering around like eating a random berry, right? And so um, I think, you know, a lot of things that I tell the families is sometimes it takes 20 exposures to a new food for them to accept it and to be able to eat it. And so um, number one is not to give up. Um, so if they say, oh, they don't like that carrot the first time they try it, it's okay. Try it again and again and again. Um, that's number one. And then the second is um, sometimes with picky eating, I always try to take out the emotional component. Children are, are very good readers of their caregivers. And so if a kiddo um, eats something, whether it's a positive or negative reaction from the parent, I try to, especially for picky eaters, I try to help the families try not to show any emotion <laughs> because whether it's good or bad, um, that's a reaction. And so you don't necessarily want to associate the child eating a specific food with a parental reaction. They just should be enjoying their food. Right. And does being exposed to more foods when you're younger make people less picky when they get older? Because I remember when I was a kid, I didn't eat anything healthy, to be honest. Like I was that pizza French fry kid. But now that I'm older, I mean, I'd eat anything pretty much. And so how important is it? Does it is how important to establish your palate when you're younger being exposed to other stuff or is it just changed over your lifetime? I think it does change over your lifetime. Your bitter sensors are actually very, um, very, very strong um, as a child. And so greens, for example, um, are actually hard for kids to, um, to eat raw because they are quite bitter. And so one thing that I love talking about is food as medicine and how to prepare foods so that um, a kiddo who hasn't ever really tasted that bitter taste and is used to eating the pizza and french fries, how can it be yummy to them, you know? And sometimes it takes small steps, like maybe it goes to sweet potato fries and then it gets to zucchini fries, right? Um, and so that's called food chaining. So, um, you know, basically using something that they know, like, and are familiar with and chaining it to something else that they might not be as familiar with, but is similar enough so that um, they're willing to try it. Gotcha. I could have used that when I was like five or six. My mom would have <laughs> loved you, I swear. <laughs> and um, dealing with fussy eaters has to be difficult. And it seems like you kind of have these like little, little tricks to try and get kids to eat more food. But you also say like they're not more apt to eating like like the their bitterness taste buds are very aggressive. And so should you wait to expose them to that so that maybe they'll like it or you should just like 
you're eating this no matter what. Yeah, I think I, my, I'm definitely along the philosophy of exposure Mm -hmm. um, because once they realize that okra is just a part of their dinner, it's just going to be in the regular rotation. um, Oftentimes they'll eventually get used to it. Obviously, if the child has issues with eating, you know, that might need medical attention. We want to address those. Um, But I'm a big fan of not having um, the parents be like a short order chef, um, because then sometimes, you know, you're cooking one meal for mom and dad and you're cooking another meal for kid number one and a different Mm -hmm. meal for kid number two. And that um, is the kid training the parent. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so we don't want that to happen. And we ideally, right, um, everybody should sit down and have the same food. When should someone reach out to a, G, a pediatric GI doctor? Because, you know, I'm sure every parent has had a fussy kit, fussy eater, you know, at some point. And, you know, what, is there a critical point when you should reach out to a doctor? Or is it more of just like come in the sooner the better so we can address this now? Or is it just like expected that at some point your kid's going to be a fussy eater? That's a great question. Um, I would say the first step is always your general pediatrician um, because the general pediatrician sort of is the quarterback for all the child subspecialists. Um, So if the pediatrician um, gives general advice about the problem, whether it's constipation or picky eating or poor weight gain or reflux, and then it's still a problem, um, then oftentimes the pediatrician will go ahead and, and make the referral. And then other things that are more emergent would be things like you know severe abdominal pain that's waking the kid up at night, um, bloody diarrhea, um, jaundice where the kids are like yellow in their eyes. That's something that might not be able to wait. And um, we would want to, like the GI doctors would wanna see the child more urgently. Yeah. And where do you see the field of pediatric GI moving next? You know, you see you're working closely with the holistic care side of things. And do you see commonalities in that the the field of GI is going to be moving towards that? Or do you feel like there's some resistance and we're kind of just in this weird stagnant lo- like place of some people are doing it or learning about it and some people aren't? I, my dream would be that every pediatric GI doctor, every pediatrician is educated in integrative modalities. It's not, you know, I don't think every, everybody needs to do acupuncture, but I do think that um, being able to take the deep dive in things like diet in things like sleep and physical activity, mental health, mind body issues, at least um, to start is so important and it's so underutilized. We are very quick to reach for the prescription pad, um, but some of these modalities where you know you're just fixing the kid's sleep and all of a sudden, you know the reflex is better because their sleep cycles were off and it you know caused them GI distress. You know that's um, harmless. <laughs> Doesn't have a ton of side effects and um, set them up for good habits for other aspects of their life as well. So that would be my dream. Um, I think reality is slow. There's no big broccoli or big kale like pushing my agenda. (laughs) So uh, big turmeric maybe someday. But um, but I I think the next step, at least for me, is, um, you know, talking to people like you. I love your podcast and how you're educating the public. Um, parents are going to vote with their pocketbooks. And so if more parents learn about this and want it for their kids, then there will be more demand and pediatricians, pediatric GIs will learn about it. We actually have a group within our um, national organization of all the peds GIs in the U.S. And um, I started the like little uh, interest group gosh, five years ago, and there were just a handful of us. And now our group has grown within our national organization. And so I think there's um, more interest from the provider side, and there's definitely more demand from the patient side. So I'm excited for the field. And are are there other projects that you're working on as well? And other than these interest groups for like holistic care? Yeah, one of our projects that's winding down is something called Scrumptious. We um, were doing a sort of a pretend cooking show using um, 
It's more for education for families, um, for patients with IBD, so Crohn's and all sort of colitis, um, basically using a very particular diet to treat um, these problems. And so um, we have uh, basically an education page on our Stanford Children's website that um, has cooking videos and educational videos teaching patients about this particular diet. So that project is wrapping up. And then um, my next big project will be to write up our fellowship. So we are training pediatricians in integrative medicine. It's the first in um, the country. And so we've graduated three fellows so far. So I'm hoping to um, write that up as a manuscript and um, just tell people that this is available. Yeah. Are there other doctors similar to what you do in the field? Of, I know there's a lot of pediatric GI doctors, but are there holistic pediatric GI doctors in other parts yeah. of the country? There are. So my um, colleagues are at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Maria Mascarenas is also Arizona um, Center for Integrated Medicine trained. Um, Alexa Russell's at Vanderbilt. Um, Josh Prajalik is at Lurie Children. So there's a handful of us that are integrative GI. We're uh, getting more and more as we speak. That's great. And what are, what are you most excited for next for the field of GI? Is it this new approach into holistic medicine? Is it, there's new research coming out about the uh, gut mic microbiome, I guess. Are there, are there anything that's up and coming that you're excited for that people may not know about? I'm really excited. I think it's the Silicon Valley, right? I think I'm excited about um, eventually being able to use artificial intelligence and um, precision medicine and machine learning to take some of this big data that we have on patients, on the gut microbiome, on diet. I, you know, in my dream world, I would be able to like look at a patient see what their diet is like, look at their disease, see where their immune system has gone wrong for Crohn's, for example, and then be like, okay, you need this medicine, this diet, this um, like lifestyle change, right? Um, right now, it's a little bit of a black box in that we think this works for the general population. And so we think this medication is going to work for you. We we're going to try this diet and, you know, hope it works for you. But um, I would love to someday be able to say, here's your precision prescription. Um, and I think it's coming. I think it's probably in, in our lifetime. <laughs> Just don't know exactly when that'll be. Are you afraid that it's going to take away some of the uh, decision making from actual physicians? Because I read up on a, a lot of AI and uh, it's it's really cool stuff, but it's also kind of scary because they're like, yeah, this AI thing figured out that you, it'll this is the best decision for you or this is the better option for you. And you're like, well, that was that's a job like that's <laughs> that's the role of a doctor to decide. So do you think that there's maybe some resistance coming out relatively soon for doctors to say that? Or do you feel like it's just going to be this idea where the, just the doctor is going to make the ultimate decision from the AI perspective? I think, I think there's always still going to be that human aspect. I have yeah. um, friends who work in the field too, and they always say garbage in, garbage out, right? So somebody has to program the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that there will always still be a human aspect of it. It might not be, you know, some of the things that we do don't necessarily need us to be doing, it would be great if some of that were automated, right? Um, and um, I would be very happy to never have to like, argue with an insurance company of, about why my patient needs it, if they could just run it through the algorithm, I would be so happy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think some things uh, artificial intelligence can really help us with. Um, and then just like you are trying to keep up with the, the field, um, I think as long as we're involved in some of the decision making, then it'll always stay relevant. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's certainly very exciting. And uh, a lot of interesting research. I've met a couple of people who are doing research with algorithms and algorithms with with medicine. And it's, it's really fascinating stuff. And it's, yeah. it's fun to, you know, ask these really interesting questions that are kind of like, what's next, like predicting the future kind of thing. Right. And uh, you, you with AI, I think people always think of uh, they think of like aliens and taking over the world, not aliens. They think of just like artificial intelligence taking Robots. over the world, like I, I yeah. robot, yeah, 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 yeah. not ro robot, and I said alien, um, but taking over and stuff. But there's so many different amazing things that technology can certainly help with, and it definitely won't help, you know, making a kid laugh or you know asking the right questions and you know 
doing all the human things that we really rely on in order to connect with our patients. And I think that's one of the largest limitations, certainly that we're going to run into, uh, is, is that human interaction. We're going to need more of that certainly in the upcoming years as AI starts to ramp itself up here. And I don't know if AI will ever, this would be a great question for some of the AI folks, but will it ever replace human intuition, right? Mm. Will it ever replace the power of touch? Um, and you know, that sort of energy field. Um, I, I don't know. I think it would be interesting to see if they could study it. <laughs> it's, it's certainly interesting. And there's, um, there are some researchers definitely trying, they, they use neuroscience to try and map out parts of the brain. So that way AI can learn the same way that a brain interacts. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that whole area is super interesting to me. I, I love talking about it, but, uh, and we're not going to dive too deep and I, I know we're running up on an hour here. So I kind of want to get to these last final questions and sure. I've, I really appreciate you spending time with us today, but the last part of this uh, podcast is the health me to health you. And the question that I really want to ask that I ask everybody is if you had everyone in the world's attention for 30 seconds, what would you say? Mm, I would say be kind first and foremost to yourself. I think people are not kind enough to themselves. Self, Self-compassion is something that I'm working on. Um, and then to others and then eat your veggies. <laughs> now, I know you work with uh, students already, but what if you could go back in time and tell your former self when you first started medical school, what would be some advice that would you, you would give yourself? I think medicine is always a journey. Um, when you're a student, you just think, oh, I'm going to go to my next exam and the next rotation and the next thing and the next thing. And when you come out, you're like, okay, is that it? But medicine and taking care of people is always about learning. It's so humbling. Um, I'm learning all the time and I feel like it's a lifetime of learning. So it's um, a marathon, not a sprint. So take the time, enjoy the journey because the journey is the most important part. I agree. And uh, final question, how do more people find out uh, more about you and how to possibly contact you in case people have questions or uh, want to know more about what you're doing? Yeah. So the Stanford Children's website is probably the best if it's, um, you know, a patient um, looking for a referral. Um, and then I'm also on social media. So um, I can send you my Twitter and Instagram handles. Perfect. And I'll put those in the show link so everybody can go and follow her if uh, you want to know or ask any questions. Thanks so much, Michael. Such of a pleasure. Course. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it.